Ladies and gentlemen, Cult Radio presents Classic Hollywood, Ruta Lee standing by. I'm so excited. Wow. She uh, said she was going to go to a quiet corner to talk to us. Was well, she had a party? <laughs> I don't know. She had Debbie Reynolds' house again. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and give her a call. She said she sounds like a Spitfire still, she huh? She does. That's her. Hello there. Hi, is this Ruta? It sure is, darling. <laughs> All right. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our next guest, an actress with over 154 credits to her resume. We are so excited to welcome Ruta Lee to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Well, I thank you very much for welcoming me so beautifully and letting me share a little time with your loving audience. Thank you, and I'm very proud to be here. Wow, I'm so proud to have you here. You sound great. How are you doing? I am doing exceedingly well, thank you. <laughs> We've just uh, come back from a wonderful Christmas trip uh, that took us on the uh, uh, Viking boats. We went on the Danube for Christmas. Wow. From, um, where did we start out? In Paris and wound up in Budapest, and it was absolutely phenomenal. And you know, the nicest part about it was that I didn't have to put away any Christmas stuff. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> let, let, me tell, let me tell you, Ruta, I gave myself a Christmas present in the fact that I bought the Twilight Zone box set. <gasps> I, I, oh. I saw your episode last night. And for a little bit, I was afraid to talk to you because you were really mean in that episode. <laughs> Wasn't I the meanest bitch imaginable? <laughs> but boy, did I get my comeuppance. <laughs> <laughs> it really had a great message because, you know, everybody's coming up in age. I certainly am. And, you know, a lot of times the young don't treat the old so well. And it sure got turned around on you, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was one of my favorite parts. And I had a grand time on it. And one of the nicest things happened that stayed in my memory box forever and ever. After a particular scene, I can't remember quite now what it was, but there was this huge round of applause coming from the grips up, you know, on the catwalks and down on the floor, and I, I sort of was stunned by the fact that this would happen, and they said, you remind us so much of Carol Lombard. Aww. You are wow. new in our hearts and we love you. And I thought, what a compliment. Because I have always been such a fan of Carol Lombard's. I thought she had it all. That she she had beauty. She had obviously some great talent. Mm -hmm. and, and she could play it all. And then she had Clark Gable. How bad can that be? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's nobody that could have... Uh, been you other than you because you have got such grace and such elegance. I describe you as looking into the beautiful ray of sunshine because that's oh, you. Wow. Thank you very, very much for saying that. I've always I've always felt like I've been blessed in many, many ways. Uh, I, I work at something that I really love. I try to live up to a credo of either paying it forward or paying it back to the Almighty for giving me what I've got and the life that I have. And I've always, you know, whenever I'm asked what I'd like to see on my tombstone, mm -hmm. it's that I brought a smile to every face that I met, two-legged, four-legged, mm -hmm. whatever. Absolutely. Well, one other Hollywood legend we were very proud to meet and I understand you know her very well and you do some great work with her and that's Debbie Reynolds. <sighs> yes, and tomorrow night um, I, I hope everybody is watching the uh, SAG Awards because she's getting a, an award for Lifetime Achievement. Wow. Well deserved. And I'm so proud of her and so thrilled to call her one of my very best friends in the world. I learned a great deal about charity and philanthropy from Debbie Reynolds. She said, you know, you can ask anybody for anything when it isn't for yourself. Right. Right. And isn't that the truth? You know, we've, we've got so many things that we worry about in life, and mostly it's about ourselves. But when you're asking somebody to help someone else, 
it's easy to ask and you don't get upset if they say no. You say, well, thanks, maybe next time. Mm -hmm. Well, I imagine that it probably hit home because I know some of the work you do with Debbie Reynolds is, is for uh, and, and to benefit mental illness. Now, you were on an episode of Mork and Mindy and then we recently had Robin Williams basically commit suicide. That kind of brought home for you, didn't it? It, it brought home for me in many, many ways. And it's so sad because the Thalians have been for 65 years now, um, not quite, but almost 65 years, been shining a spotlight because we were a group of young Hollywood people mm -hmm. that needed to devote themselves to something beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. And they decided that mental health was something that was not being touched by most of the charities. And no, we're talking a lot of years ago. Mm -hmm. When they decided to go ahead and support mental health for youngsters. And the, the doctor that was dealing with the youngsters who had problems said that a kid with a problem, an emotional problem, is like an apple that is rotten in a barrel right. and it'll it'll contaminate the entire barrel the entire community if it isn't taken care of so we started dealing with just emotionally disturbed children then 18 years later we built the first building in the Cedar Sinai complex which was Thalian's mental health center and very proudly dealt with mental health from pediatric through geriatric now we have changed our format and our allegiance and we are with UCLA taking care of returning wounded warriors wow. taking care of their mental health problems and I think you and your listeners will all agree these are the young men and women who fall through the cracks you know when they return having given up their time in many cases given up their lives for us and they are not getting the best America has to offer and we're trying to do something about that. So that's fantastic. We just recently uh, featured a director and did a, a very fine film on PTSD which is post-traumatic stress disorder yes. and they, they really go through a lot, they do. It's, it's awful and, and it's not recognized by all of us. None of us are trained to recognize problems or how to deal with them and so we just sort of fluff things aside and we we let someone stay in the street and stay homeless because they can't get a job and we've got to do something about that if if our kids are willing to do what they do to keep america free we have to do something to keep them sound and whole and working and contributing to the society Absolutely. And, and through the years, I mean, not only you and Debbie have worked with the Thalians, but you've had people join the ranks of you, such as Gene Kelly, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Mary Tyler Moore, Whoopi Goldberg, all of these people coming and giving their time to help, right? Absolutely. And, and listen, it's not always easy, although I must say that years ago, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it wasn't impossible to pick up the phone and call a Frank Sinatra or call a Dean Martin or call a Sammy Davis or call Bing Crosby and say, we need you. We need you to come and be our honoree. Yeah, well, okay, I don't really want to do it, but I'll be there. What the hell time do you want? <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> Nowadays, and, and I realize that I'm, I'm making a very broad stroke here and not everybody fits into it, but I have discovered in the last... 15 or 20 years that when you want an honoree to come in and do something it's well will you send a private plane to pick us up right. and there'll be 12 people and my business manager and my conductor and we'll all stay at the hotel and you'll have to pay for that and I'm bringing 12 other people and oh there will be a Rolex at the end right <laughs> <laughs> I think wow. you know yeah. isn't that sad wow. isn't it, is. it sad and I don't know whether it's those of us who grew up knowing a little bit about vaudeville or, or entertainment that was tough, you know, before we became movie stars overnight, that you, you had to do something to pay it back. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody minded doing all that work. 
And actors are the only people in our business, not just our business, but in any business, that give away the only thing they have to sell, which is their time. Right. You know, I think and you some- just answered my next question. If you think about what happened in the Twilight Zone uh, when your husband became young, if that could happen to you, would you rather be younger now and come up in today's Hollywood or know that you were part of that great thing called classic Hollywood that, you know, which is sad. We don't really have a lot of it anymore, but we still have some uh, people like you and otherwise. Would you rather have been who you were back then when you were doing what you were doing? You still work today, of course. Or would you rather just be starting out now? Nope, I don't want to start out now. Good, good girl. I love where we were. I love worshiping at the shrine of some of the wonderful performers, whether it was on the, the big screen, the little screen, or stage. Uh, I loved getting to know those people. I loved being recognized by them as as an entity that had something to contribute. Um, it was a great part of our business. Yeah. And, I mean, there are some wonderful performers now. And I don't mean to demean anybody by saying, you know, that they're they're a, a very selfish little group but there there is kind of a selfishness mm-hmm. that i don't think was existent in my growing up days now mind you i came in on the tail end of it right you did. but at least i still got the thrill of knowing some of those ageless and forever to live in our heart stars well i have to ask you ruta i know that uh terry and myself are both huge twilight zone fans but another show and this was actually from what i read online you can correct me if i'm wrong was the show that gave you your start and that was you started off with a little role on the roy rogers show right I don't think so. Roy Rogers? That's what it said on the internet. It might have been wrong. wrong. Sometimes it's wrong on the internet. If, if, I, if I did, I, I would kill myself because I was such a big fan of his <laughs> and Dale's. And I don't remember doing that. My, my first show that I seem to remember was Superman. Yes. The Adventures of Superman. The, right there. Superman. And, yes. and then there was a, a lovely man named Frank Wisbar had something called the Fireside Theater. And I did one or two of those. But my real first start was the Burns and Allen show. Yes. I, uh, I think that's what got me my card, you know, my Screen Actors Guild card. Because I was working in a little theater while I was going to high school. And it's a wonder I graduated, considering that, you know, we'd do a show and then we'd rehearse, and the next day I have to get up to go to school, and I'd come in and rehearse again and do a show. <laughs> uh, it, boy, it's good to be young and be able to do all that. <laughs> but um, but uh, my, one of the associate uh, directors or producers on, on the show we were doing on the town suggested me that the casting directors over at... Uh, the studio where Burns and Allen were working, and I got to play Sandy a couple of times, and Sandy was the name of their daughter. Uh, so it was great fun, and I, I enjoyed it very much, and I'm very, very grateful to the Burns and Allen people. And then George Burns continued to be kind of a fan and friend of mine, and he would come to the Thalians events every year, and he would sit at my table, and I felt so honored and so delighted to have a living legend mm. say, yeah, Roots, I'll come. <laughs> I would go into the, the mausoleum to visit Gracie. and then Oh, that, how nice of you. Oh, I do this. And then that day came when they were there together. And, and my God, he just like, he never really got over her. I mean, you know, it really was a, a, a great Hollywood relationship. It really was. It, it, it truly was. It, it was. And, and I just have, am so thrilled that it was more than just worshipping his shrine, but that he came to help and paid for a ticket. You know, it was just wonderful. What was it like for a young girl to be working with Superman? You know, I discovered <laughs> that was the first day I discovered you don't mess with unions. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was supposed to dance with some young man whose name I've forgotten now. And I thought, oh, it's, it's 
lunchtime, why don't you and I rehearse the jitterbug or whatever we were going to do? And there was a record player on the set, and I grabbed the cord, and I went to plug it in the wall, and some guy came along and said, don't do that, or we'll have you thrown off the set. <laughs> I didn't belong to that union. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So, um, like I said, don't mess with the union. <laughs> you know what's really ironic? I got such a, a tickle out of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, because sometimes IMDb is wrong. Uh, you were fired from Grauman's Chinese Theater, and then <laughs> after that, you had a star <laughs> on the Walk of Fame in front of Grauman's Chinese Oh, my God! This, this is, you know, talk about serendipity and, and, and God working in the most mysterious ways. I was always lousy in math, let's put it that way, okay, kids? Yeah. And, and I got a job as an usherette at Grauman's Chinese, and there I was in my little red uh, you know, tunic with the black swingy pants, and I stood at the top of the aisle with a flashlight. Those were the days when you took people down to a seat, you right. know? Right. And, and I'd stand at the top of the aisle in my glory, w just watching June Haver, Betty Grable, uh, uh, Ethel Merman, Mitzi Gaynor, and amazingly enough, every one of those ladies later in life became my friends. And boy, do I get thrilled at that thought. Wow. And then one day, uh, the candy girl uh, either got sick or quit, or I don't know, and I got moved up to candy girl. Now, I could deal with everything because everything was 10 cents, 15 cents, 25 cents, 50 cents. I could deal with those numbers. Mm -hmm. And then one day, and then I, I could, you know, when the counter wasn't busy, I'd run over and watch the musical. <laughs> right. Then one day, the cashier got sick. And those were the days when you had a, a register where you pushed the numbers and so on and so forth and supposedly gave you the right change. But tickets were $1.98, two sixty five, you know, all those <laughs> dumb numbers that I couldn't deal with. So I know they said you push two tickets at two sixty five and you put in five dollars and it'll give you the right change. Well, long story short, we were forty dollars short that night. Oh. And I got fired. And I said to the, the man the, the the manager, I, I I didn't steal and one of these days you'll be sorry because I'll be back and my footprints will be here. And boy, you're gonna be really sorry because I didn't do this and I cried all the way home. Fade out, fade in. A lot of years later, I get my star on the prize place on Hollywood Boulevard, right in front of the box office of Grumman's Chinese. Now, is that heaven or what? <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Well, per per perhaps you're... Perhaps your time it, there watching the musicals, Ruta, was well spent because your big first big feature film was as one of the brides in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Do you know how lucky I was? It was just amazing. And those were the days when it was a six-day week, not a five-day week like it is now in showbiz. Uh, not showbiz, but movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was just an amazing experience um, I think being Lithuanian and knowing how to polka and waltz and all of that good stuff along with a little bit of ballet training and whatnot that I had as a kid growing up uh, when they asked me to do something a little country after I had done my pretty little ballet steps uh, at the audition I'm speaking, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, they asked me if I could do something a little country, and I said, boy, can I do a little country, and I started <laughs> in polkaing for them, the, the good old Lithuanian way with stamping the feet and jumping around and having a very good time, and son of a gun if I didn't get the job. <laughs> well, it was, it was absolutely spectacular, and, and we had the, the ballet bar class every morning when we came in for rehearsal and Michael Kidd you know the choreographer of so many wonderful things on Broadway was of course uh, big at MGM as well and um, I would take the class and all of a sudden I'd say oh my god what am I doing here these are the best dancers in America that have been combined for this this fabulous new movie 
and, and I'm not the best dancer in America. I'm not the best anything in America. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and I just sort of looked up to God and said, just, you know, let it be, let it be. But I learned something, I think, very important on Seven Brides about entertainment and show business. And it's not your technique that counts. It's how you sell it. For yes. sure. And, you know, no one's really paying attention to whether your feet are turned out and doing fancy steps. What they're looking at is you as a personality and, and what you're selling. And so it was a great learning experience to work with all those marvelous people. Well, have you know, getting a chance to be with your idol, Jane Powell, I mean... Yeah. Right she was the dearest, most wonderful girl. And, of course, she's still very much alive and blooming in New York. And I, unfortunately, never really get to see her. That reminds me. I've got to, I've got to get a hold of her number, and the next time I go to New York, look Good her up, you. and we'll have a glass or ten of wine. You know. <laughs> I have watched me a few uh, Jane Powell theaters in my time, for sure. I used to love that show. But, uh, you know, I seriously think maybe you could have gone into politics because you did something that not a lot of people would have enough talent to do. You got your mother released from a communist country. Yes. My grandmother. Your grandmother, excuse me, grandmother. Yeah, my grandmother. My, my mother was the one basically responsible for my ever being in show business. She didn't know. I was born in Montreal, Canada. Mm -hmm. And she was a peasant girl who was the eldest of a whole bunch of daughters and carried her shoes to church every Sunday because they had to be passed down to the next daughter and the next daughter and the next daughter. Very poor family. They, they, my mother was married in Lithuania and eventually they came to Canada because the quotas were closed into the United States where everybody knew that the streets were paved with gold, you know. But I was born in Montreal, and um, my uh, kindergarten teacher said to my mother, your daughter is a little different than most of our kids in class. Give her lessons. Give her dancing lessons. Give her music lessons. Give her something so that she can do whatever she wants to. And my mother thought, fine. If she uses it, fine. If she doesn't, fine. And we, she didn't know anything about Broadway or New York, or what that all meant to show business. But she did know movies. And my mother sort of pictured me as Lithuania's answer to Shirley Temple. There you go. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and so she communicated with a wonderful priest that became a friend of theirs who had started a tiny little Lithuanian Catholic parish here in Los Angeles. And she knew about movies, and they were made in Hollywood. And she would send him a few bucks every once in a while, and he invited my mother and father to come to California and, and get a feel for what it was like. Well, this was 19, what, 47, 48. And they came to Los Angeles midwinter in February when we were up to our fannies and snow in Montreal. And here the flowers were blooming the palm trees were swaying. It was unbelievably beautiful. And they fell so in love, and my mother cried all the way home on the train to Montreal. Wow. And somehow, by magic, don't ask me how, because it was after the war, and all of the Lithuanian quotas were uh, handed out to displaced persons in Europe uh, to get into the U.S. But some miracle happened. She must have prayed very, very hard. And we came to Southern California. So I did all my growing up here. Uh, I, I went to one term of junior high here and then to Immaculate Heart High School. And then I broke free and went to Hollywood High. <laughs> <laughs> I would have kept going to a Catholic school, except there wasn't a bus that could take me there, but Hollywood High did. Right. Wow. So yeah. I loved it and, and had great wonderful experiences and it's such fun to think that that lana turner went there and carol burnett went there mm -hmm. and carol wells went there <coughs> excuse me 
And so it, it was wonderful fun growing up and going to Hollywood High. Well, you, you seem like one that would really adapt to things and one that found the best and joy in everything. Uh, a lot of actresses maybe wouldn't have done this, but you had said, or at least if IMDb is quote me right, that uh, you were a little disappointed for a while because there was a, a few lack of roles. So you started doing the game show thing and wound up as a game show co-host. You know, I am... I, I, Again, I say God works in mysterious ways. When when the big stars discovered television, where I was kind of one of the prime leading ladies on on television, I guessed it on every show that there was. You were, and the roles <laughs> became a little thinner, and I, you know, I was being replaced by a big name star. Uh, so then, the game shows and the talk shows were very important to me. And what I loved about them is that the game shows and talk shows had audiences all across the United States meeting me, Ruta Lee, as myself and not as a, a hooker or a, a, a dope addict or right. a young mother. You know, it, it, I, it wasn't a character. They were meeting me personally and they got to liking me that way. And then when I went out on the road, in plays all over the country, I had not a set of fans, but a set of friends. There you go. Yes. Because they watched me in their living room, they watched me in their bedroom through their toes at night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it was wonderful fun because people would come backstage and say, "Hey, Rudy, you want to come home for dinner? <laughs> Isn't that sweet?" Rather than Miss Lee, may I have your autograph? Right. Well, I have to ask you, Ruta, I mean, it, it, there's so much to talk about, so many people that you worked with, but this this one tidbit I found very interesting. In 1955, you worked with Mickey Rooney in The Twinkle in God's Eye, and then you got a chance to work with him again in 2007 in A Christmas Too Many. What was it like not only meeting him, knowing him, and working with him, but coming back and working with him again decades later? Decades later, we knew each other quite well. He had always been very, very respectful of the work that I did for the Thalians. And if, when I stop and think about it, he was one of our last honorees when we were doing a yearly show. Clint Eastwood, I had been after for 20 years to be our honoree, and he finally gave in. And then the next year, we did an all-girl kind of military tribute to Mickey Rooney, who really, really cared about our veterans. And I had known him for quite some time and enjoyed him very, very much. Um, he did my television show when I was doing Talk of the Town. Uh, he, he, he was just a darling. Um, tough to work with because... Uh, not too much patience for everybody and everything, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, what a gifted, fabulous man. And he was a great honoree, and all I can do is say thank you, Lord, for putting him into my life. It was a great treat. I look back at those old movies and that energy that <clears throat> never failed him, and I think, wow, what a gift, what a whirlwind, what a powerhouse. And to think that he was my friend was very special. Now, you know, a lot of people would, would look <laughs> at your credits and they would see something like Sergeants 3, where you're on the set with people like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis Jr., and they would think, wow, now that had to be a tough set. What was it like working with the Rat Pack? It was one hysterical laugh after <laughs> another. Working with Frank was quite wonderful because... He was a stickler about don't waste our energy. He would say <clears throat> to the management and the crew, take all the time in the world to set this up. If it's a dolly shot, I don't want to hear, oh, something creaked in the middle of a take. I don't want to hear, oh, a light went out in the middle of a take. I don't want to hear the sound went. So take all the time, set it up, We'll come in and do it once, and either you get it or you don't. Mm. Well, that's a slight exaggeration. There were times when maybe we did it twice or three times. But he would rehearse it, let them set it up, and then go. 
Well, in the meantime, what did they do but horse around and have a great time and throw crackers <laughs> at each other? And it, it was marvelous, marvelous fun, and I will never forget it. We shot a lot of it up in Kanab, Utah, which, of course, is known as Little Hollywood because of right. all the westerns that were made up there. Mm-hmm. And not too uh, many years ago, I got a hitching post there, ah. which is kind of nice because I have the star on Hollywood Boulevard, <laughs> a star on the Walk of Fame in Palm Springs, yes. a star in front of the Cedar in, at Cedar Sinai in front of the Thalian Building, and a hitching post in <laughs> Kanab, Utah. Wow! But you talked about cowboys. He's pretty much known for cowboy films. Did a, a couple uh, crazy films I love called Motel Hell because I love those crazy films. Rory Calhoun. Now, I heard he was a real ladies' man. Here you are, this beautiful woman. <laughs> I got to know. Uh, he, he, if he was a ladies' man, uh, he wasn't with me because I was a good friend of his wife. Ah, okay. There you <laughs> go. Rita Barron. Yes. Who later used to date um, a darling George Burns. <laughs> and would come to the Thalian events with George Burns. And Lita Barron uh, is still very much alive and in Palm Springs. And um, they they had this lovely marriage, and I would go visit them. They had a house on uh, Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills. And we became very good friends. So he didn't mess with me. Now, in some ways, maybe I sort of missed out on a lot of things because <laughs> everybody always treated me like one of the buddies and nobody ever tried to get me into bed I'm sorry to say well it all worked well, out we well were blind yeah. so <laughs> it, it all worked out well because you, you met a great man and and uh, you wound up with several houses and you say you like to sleep around which is a joke <laughs> that you like to say that's funny but but I, I think he's got to be a great man to handle the spitfire that you are he, he he is a great guy, and he's the best thing that ever happened to me. And I met him on a plane. Uh, I was doing a, a show in Texas and had been invited by the LPGA to be their guest star at the opening of their, or the closing of their ceremonies, I've forgotten now, in Naples, Florida. And I was on my way back and had to do a show that night and didn't have a stitch of makeup on, a babushka and whatnot, and I was... The, the girl said, we'll, we'll pre-board you as soon as the flight is cleaned up. It's a turnaround flight from Miami to Dallas. And as I stood there, leaning on the counter, I looked down the hallway, and I saw this great pair of Gucci loafers coming down the hall. And then I looked up a little further, nice slacks with a crease in them. A little further, a double-breasted blazer <laughs> with gold <laughs> buttons. Yes. A little <laughs> further up, this fabulous craggy face with a shock of silver hair a cross between Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin somewhere in there <laughs> and I thought be still my heart <laughs> and he came right by and walked right by our counter down the hall and I thought oh hell ships that pass in the night Right. they pre-board me I get my seat which is always I always ask for the bulkhead seat and I had all my stuff in the seat next to me. I was in the window seat, and I was shoving stuff under my seat. I'd taken down a blanket and a pillow. I had to sleep because I have to do a show tonight. Mm-hmm. And suddenly I looked down, and the same pair of shoes are standing in the aisle. And he looked at the stuff in the seat, and he said, Is the seat taken? <laughs> and I said, For the last time in my life, No. <laughs> And he said, hello, my name is Webb Lowe. And I said, hello, my name is Ruta Lee. And we should be married because then I'd be Ruta Lee Lowe and we could open a Chinese laundry. Wow. Well, needless to say, almost 40 years later, he's pissed. We don't have a laundry. Wow. Wow. I, I've got to ask you before I let you go. We're about to let you go here. But I, I love watching movies. I'm a movie nut. I'm going to watch this little movie tonight. I, I, I know you're busy or I'd ask you to come over. But I just want, wanted to know if, if you think this is a good movie or not. It's called The Doomsday Machine. <laughs> the worst piece of crap ever put on this earth. <laughs> I have such funny story to tell you. There were some darn good people in it. I mean, Mala Powers was in it. And, um, oh, who's the, the, the Gorton Fisherman? I'm, oh, Denny Miller. Mm-hmm. And, well, anyway, good, good people. Oh, Henry Wilcoxon was in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a huge star at Paramount. 
in fact, son-in-law to Cecil B. DeMille. Hmm. And anyway, it, it was one of those movies where it was a space movie, and the space seats on the plane were barbershop chairs <laughs> that, <laughs> that they had sort of rigged up, and they kept running out of money, and so the entire cast was told by the union not to go to work until they came in with the checks for that day. Wow. And that's what we had to do. And then eventually the movie never got finished. And some Japanese company brought it and gave it some sort of a bizarre ending. So, honey, please call me tomorrow and tell me how it comes out, will you? <laughs> I think you'd probably rather have me watch Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I think so. Or Witness for the Prosecution or Sergeant Three or Bullet for a Bad Man. I don't care. <laughs> well, before, before we let you go, Ruta, I do have to ask you, because we've had the opportunity to have some uh, actresses on the show, like we had Mamie Van Doren on, who... Talk to us about some of the glamour girls that she got to meet and work with, and sometimes it turned out well, and sometimes it didn't. Uh, but you definitely got to work with somebody who was considered one of Hollywood's classic glamour girls, and somebody I love, and that's Marlena Dietrich. But oh, I heard yes. she could be difficult to work with. What was she like on set? Uh, Marlena was very cool, very distant, very nice but not a warm, loving personality. Right. And very interesting, uh, when I got the job and she saw the, the little bit of film when they photographed me, um, I was blonde, and she said, Nick Nine, forget it. <laughs> and I became a brunette overnight. And um, so I, I admired her always. I would run into her every once in a while in Las Vegas or somewhere, not very often, however, but I, I really, really loved and respected how the woman knew how she should be photographed. Yes. I, like a twit, never really paid attention to that. I figured the guys who shoot know what they're doing. But she carried a trunk of special lights, of special shading effects. Wow of special uh, gobos, everything necessary. And if the cameraman, you know, she'd say, I'd like a, a little light here on the face, I'd like a little bit over here. Say, no, no, Marlena, we don't need that. We don't have a camera. She says, yes, I do. <laughs> and she knew what she was doing, and boy, oh boy, did it pay off for her. Yeah, definitely. Well, boy, I'm really glad you're bubbly and friendly with you being uh, Lithuanian and her being whatever she is. That could have got ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Lithuania took uh, was taken over by Germany a lot of times. Yeah. But God bless her. She was a staunch American and really cared about our people. And she went out and did all the, the camp shows and everything. And I admire her very, very much for taking that strong position. Are, are you still going to be doing any off-Broadway or Broadway stuff? Because, God, I would love to have seen you in the best little uh, whorehouse in Texas. Oh, I, I would love to have you see me in it because yeah. I'm, I'm a very good madam. I, I love the show. I'm heading out, in fact, at the end of this week uh, to Texas where I am doing Steel Magnolias. Oh, great. And so I'll be back towards the end of uh, March. And I'm going to have a wonderful time in my favorite theater in the country, which is Casa Manana in Fort Worth, Texas. Fantastic. You got anything else coming up you wanted to mention? Or? Let's see. What else do I have coming up? Uh, well, that's it for the moment. And, uh, and then, of course, as you may or may not know, I am, I'm writing a book. I've been writing it for five years. <laughs> It's probably going to be 10 by the time I finish with it. Wow. It is so hard because every time I go to edit and take something out, all I do is put more in, you know. Right, right. Well, it's because but, you've uh, done so much. That's I know. Like, like when my, my daughter here brings me your notes, it's like an encyclopedia. It's huge. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is so sweet of you to take the time to visit with me and to to share your listeners with me. I'm, I'm very, very proud to be a part of it, and I thank you for your time Absolutely. and your interest. And, and, of course, all I can say to anybody listening is if you want more information, just go to rudalee.com. You'll That's get perfect. it all there. That's it, right. It's such an honor to, to be able to talk to a legend. You really are. 
and and you stay well because we need your bright and sunshiny face right where it is. I thank you from my very bottom, which is my best part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much for being on the show, Ruto. You have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A happy new year to everybody, and may God bless America. Same to you. All right, bye bye. Bye bye, darling.